Good morning, everybody. It's great to be with you this morning, uh, both those of you who are worshiping with us in the sanctuary and also those of you who are worshiping with us at home. I'm going to start with a, a brief reading from Psalm 148. Let's listen to God's word together. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. He set them in place forever and ever. He gave a decree that will never pass away. And we're going to be talking a little bit later about training our attention, training our, our eyes, training our hearts on, on what is most important. And the psalmist reminds us that that's what all of creation does. All of creation, in all of its movements, in all of its... Uh, in all of its uh, mechanisms, is all directed towards the praise of God, the silent praise of God. You know, when, it's, when we look at the stars in the sky, the loud praise of God, when we think of the waves crashing on the shore, um, everything that God created is, is designed to, to, to speak to his glory, and that includes us. And so whatever we have going on, right, whatever we're, we're wrestling with, whatever burdens we're carrying, um, God calls us in this moment, God invites us in this moment to, to, to set those things aside and to, to fix our eyes on him, to fix our attention on him, and to, to, to lift up his name, knowing that he's a God who will hear us when we, we call on him. He's a God who, who delights in the praises of his children. So um, as we stand to worship, let's join our voices with, with all of the, the heavenly hosts, the sun, the moon, the shining stars, the, the waters, uh, and all of creation to, to lift up the name of our God. Let's worship together.
of broken and crimson sin. He sees only white, and I can't do anything to gain what he's done. He just loves me, cause he loves me, cause he loves me, just because he does. Just because he does. I'm his beloved. I am his friend. His love has no limit from me. Scripture reading is from the first letter of Paul uh, to the Corinthians. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, 
that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. You may be seated. Remember how you told me that life may not be easy, and everything that I need, you've already given me. I remember how you told me I can trust you. of my redemption Lord how could I question when you prove that you die for me walk me
Please pray with me. God, we come before you this morning giving you thanks for who you are. God, as the, as the psalm we, we read earlier reminds us, you are the God who is behind everything we see. You're the God who formed this universe. You're the God who calls to life all things. And Lord, you're, you're the God who invites our voices to, to join with the voices of, of creation all around us to lift you up. And we thank you that you are a God who is worthy of that kind of praise. You're a God who's worthy of that kind of adoration and, and worship. God, we also thank you that, that you are a God who walks with us, as we just sang. You walk with us through fires. You walk with us through struggles, through temptations and trials and tests. And, and, and not only do you walk with us, but you, you carry our burdens for us, and we give you thanks for that. God, we, we lift up to you those who are carrying heavy burdens this morning, or those who are sick, those whose loved ones are sick those who are grieving, uh, God, those who are alone or feel alone, those who are um, wrestling with, with all kinds of, of struggles, Lord, whether they're emotional struggles, physical struggles, spiritual, financial, family, uh, relational, all the, all the things that we carry through this world, God, we, we know that we don't have the strength to carry them on our own, and so we lift them up to you. We, we lay them at your feet. We ask you to, to, to take our burdens from us and to walk beside us, to, to carry us as you carry the things we, we, we wrestle with. And God, we, uh, we thank you for your son, Jesus. As the, the, the passage we just read from 1 Corinthians reminds us, Lord, of all the things that we can fix our minds on, of all the things we can fix our attention on, uh, those things of most importance, uh, the, the, the notion that your son Jesus came into this world. He, he taught us. He, he took on our humanity and everything that means. He went to the cross for us. He was raised from the dead for us. And uh, he, he lives forever. He'll return to, uh, to take us to, to be with you and to, to, to reign uh, alongside uh, him uh, forever and ever. God, these are truths. These are, these are hopes that are too wonderful for us. And yet we we rest in them, we trust in them, we, uh, we place our hope in them. So God, be with us today as we continue to worship, as we continue to, to fix our eyes and our ears, our hearts and our minds on what is most important, uh, which is your kingdom, your word, your love, your grace, your truth, and, and all the ways that you draw us into deeper fellowship, deeper friendship with you and, and with each other. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen. Most of us have heard the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. It appears in all four Gospels and is a story of God providing for a human need in a miraculous way. So we tend to tell it a lot. But as a quick recap, uh, 5,000 men plus women and children, so probably more like 20 or 10 to 20,000 people, are gathered to listen to Jesus speak and they get hungry. And the only food nearby is five loaves of bread and two fish. People began to panic because this is obviously not enough food. Uh, but Jesus breaks the bread and the fish and feeds the whole crowd and even has leftovers. A lot of leftovers. It is undeniably a miracle witnessed by thousands of people. And in three of the Gospels, the story just stops there. They all got to eat. But in the Gospel of John, he adds this. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, surely he is the prophet we have been expecting. And then they go on to want to make him their king. The crowd is obviously excited over this miraculous sign. For years and years, the Jews have been waiting for the Messiah, and they're starting to recognize him. But the Jews also had a long history of forgetting and doubting God's goodness sometimes almost immediately. And this story is no different. John's gospel also tells us that the very next day, the very same crowd came to look for Jesus, wanting more from him. They now have an urgent spiritual hunger that they don't quite understand. 
And Jesus tells them to spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. And the still confused crowd says, we want to perform God's works too. What should we do? And Jesus replies to them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. That's simple enough. Completely contrary to the long list of rules they were raised with, their only requirement now is to believe in the Christ. But they answered, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. As if Jesus had not done exactly this 24 hours before. Give us a sign. Give us bread like Moses. Like, bro, I just did that. <laughs> we'll do it again. Then we'll believe you. He actually does do it again. He feeds 4,000 in Matthew and Mark's Gospels. And that time the Pharisees came to him afterwards demanding another sign as if he hadn't given plenty already. But how often do we do this? We forget. We doubt. God does something obvious for our benefit and we praise him. And then later we question whether or not he'll come through for us again. We want another sign. We want more proof. Then we won't feel anxious or fearful or hopeless or hungry. Jesus calls the crowd out on this. He goes on to say, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me, even though you have seen me. And his disciples don't know what to think about this, and they start murmuring, and the, cr the crowd starts murmuring in disagreement. So Jesus keeps pressing his point. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will not die. His followers still struggle to understand and believe. They still doubt. So Jesus doubles down. I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. This is very hard to understand, they replied. How can anyone accept it? And a lot of them stopped following him at that point. But what they didn't have then that we have now is the end of the story. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and the resurrection from the dead hadn't happened yet. And this was the ultimate sign they were looking for, and it wasn't that far off. And when it did happen, many remembered. And now, 2,000-something years later, we remember we remember his miraculous signs, his divine word, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his promise that we would have eternal life. We remember together each week at this table as we take the bread and the cup, and we do the only thing required of us. We believe in the one he has sent. stories of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're good
Let us pray over the Lord's Supper. Loving Father, Lord, what a wonderful gift you've given to us in your Son. God, you gave him to us that he might be the focus of our lives. Lord, our first thought when we wake up, our last thought when we lay down at night. God, in in every relationship we have, in our marriages, in our, with our children, with our friendships, with, Lord, every interaction we have, Lord, we are to put him first. Lord, we are to focus on him. We are to do the things that he would have done, say the things that he would do. Lord, this focus, Lord, is often diverted, often distracted. God, we... We struggle to put our attention on this most precious gift that you've sent to us. God, this most perfect and complete expression of love that you have bestowed upon us. And God, this morning, as we come to this table, this is another regular opportunity for us to put our focus on him, to put our focus on our Lord and Savior. God, to, to do what he did to say the things that he said, Lord, uh, around that final fateful meal. God, to gather around this table in the way that he did with those who followed him. And we know that as we do this this morning, if we focus on him, if our thoughts and our hearts are on him, Lord, that that meal will be just, this meal will be just as it was then, Lord, and his presence will be here with us, Lord, as we gather, 
Lord, as we gather as his body, Lord, as we gather in his name, as we gather with him at the, at the front of our minds. God, help us to see him now, not just in these elements which, which symbolize him, God, but, but him present with us, Lord, him with us individually and with us corporately as the body of Christ. God, we thank you for this gift, and we pray these things in his precious name. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus gathered with his disciples to celebrate the Passover. During the meal, he took the bread, he broke it, and passed it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body broken for you. In the same way after supper, he took the cup, he poured it, blessed it, passed it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray for our offering. O oh, loving Father, Lord, we thank you for the many gifts that you've given to us. God, not the least of which is, is your son. God, we do, we hope to do at least all these things in, in his name, Lord, in the example that he showed us. Lord, he gave himself to the people around him so completely. He gave himself to us so completely. And God, we know that you have called us to mirror that spirit of giving. Lord, whatever that looks like, whether it's money, which he, he so often had little of. Lord, whether it's time, Lord, which we often so have little of. Whether it's talents, Lord, that you've blessed us with. Whatever it is that we have, Lord, that we can contribute to your kingdom. God, help us to do that this morning. We know from your word. We know from your example and your son and the apostles that surrounded him and the many saints since that you can do incredible things through, through very little, through people of meager means, through people of meager upbringings, through people in small places and small churches like this, God, that you can do big things. God, we pray that as we give this morning, whatever we give, whether it be, even if it's only prayers, Lord, we know that those can be so powerful, that those can be used for your glory and to build up your kingdom. Lord, we pray that as we give this morning, that you do those things, that you amplify and multiply what we give in ways that we can't imagine, just as you've done with your son in our lives. We pray these things in his name. Amen.
As the kids head downstairs for Children's Church, we are continuing our, uh, our journey through the Gospel of Matthew. Today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 15, looking at verses 1 to 28. Let's listen to God's word together. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, and why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand, what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. But what comes out of their mouth, this is what defiles them. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? He replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Peter said, explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word, so his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the ways that your word continues to speak to us and challenge us and convict us and shape us. And so, God, we pray that as we spend some time in, in, in this word this morning, that you would give us eyes to see you and give us ears to hear you. Uh, you would give us hearts and minds that are open to what you might have to say to us. And in all things, God, we pray that you would have the glory. It's in the name of your son that we pray these things. Amen. Sometime in the next couple of weeks, as students begin to return to Milligan for the fall semester, I'll have the opportunity to, to sit down with a number of them for advising appointments. So we'll look at how they're doing, we'll look at how their, their work at Milligan is progressing, and what they need to do in order to graduate when they want to graduate. The chief question, especially as they get into their second and third year and beyond, is the question of their major. If they haven't picked one yet, they'll have to zero in on where their interest lies or what their goals look like. And if they have picked one, then, then my primary objective is, is making sure they're taking the classes they need to take, assembling the right schedule so that they fulfill their requirements. Because the last thing they want to do is, is reach their senior year and realize they've wasted their time and their tuition dollars on all the wrong courses so that now they're stuck in an impossible spot when it comes to graduation. And because it's sometimes tough to focus on what's most important, that's where I come in. And because I sometimes have trouble keeping track of all these requirements, I might be one to whom Jesus would say, are you still so dull? Uh, that's where the registrar comes in. I would be utterly lost without her guidance, without the, the, the checklist that, that the registrar sends me that helped to, to train my attention and my students' attention on the major things that they need to concentrate on. I think that sometimes we all need this sort of guidance. One of the easiest things we can do as human beings, but, but also one of the most destructive things we can do, is simply to just take our eyes off what is most important. 
to major in the minors, as it's sometimes put. And of course, this is not just an issue when it comes to building a college schedule. As important as graduation requirements might be, they pale in comparison to the everyday choices that we face about what is most crucial, the, the perennial opportunities that we have to get distracted, the constant temptation to waste our time and our energy on things that are of secondary importance. When Jesus came into the world, he, he came to a people that, like all of us, sometimes lost their way when it came to these sorts of significant questions. I think we, we sometimes fall into the trap of assuming that ancient men and women all looked like the, the figures we see in classical sculptures or paintings, that they were either embroiled in epic battles where the fate of the world hung in the, hung in the balance, or they were engaging with deep philosophical questions all the time. But in reality, even if our ancestors in the faith didn't have social media or cable news or an endless stream of information clogging up the airwaves, demanding their attention, dangling before them endless priorities and perspectives, all competing for the title of most important, that doesn't mean they didn't sometimes take their eyes off the ball, that they didn't sometimes major in the minors, that they didn't sometimes forget what was most significant, what was most worthy of their attention and affection. Often within the history of God's people, Israel, this is where the prophets would come in. When, because of corrupt leadership or idolatrous worship or sinful behaviors, the communal institutions of Israel would begin to erode, the prophets would walk onto the scene, often with, with strong, scathing reminders of where people's hearts and minds needed to be. The prophets would call their fellow Israelites back to faithfulness with fiery sermons, with vivid dem demonstrations of what a life devoted to God can and should look like. And if the examples of these prophets, figures like Micah and Jeremiah and Isaiah and Jonah and Hosea, if, if their examples in, in word and deed serve to, to, to draw the, the people back into fellowship with God, call the people's repentance, so much more was the life and work of Jesus himself, the word of God incarnate, who came to to show his people the way. More than that even, more than just being a prophet, Jesus came to be the way. He came to draw them away from all the petty, insignificant half-truths that were clouding their vision of who God wanted them to be. And this was never more evident than in Jesus's seemingly endless confrontations with the religious leaders of his time. In fact, it's often been said that Jesus's major dispute with the Pharisees and, and the teachers of the law wasn't so much about his as, as wasn't so much about belief as it was about priorities. If you were to ask Jesus what the life of faith was all about, as the teachers of the law sometimes did, his answer, love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength, love your neighbor as yourself, would align with the same answers that they would give. The problems emerged when it came to applying these things, to applying these principles in ways that reflected their significance. It's one thing when, when asked to say what is most important. It's another thing entirely to be able to put these beliefs into practice in the midst of concrete and often complicated questions. In Matthew chapter 15, we see a couple of instances of this kind of dilemma. Situations in which the minors threatened the majors. Moments when the distractions of religious ritual and the, the rigors of narrow tradition threatened to get in the way of what was most important, threatened to obscure the, the kind of life of faithful trust and loving fellowship that God desires to have with his children. So the chapter hope opens with, with the sort of conflict that is all too often a fixture in Jesus' interactions with the Pharisees. It's centered on a, a kind of arcane matter of religious observance that Jesus' enemies were, were always looking to trip him up on various things like this. Here they, they choose to pick on his disciples because the disciples don't wash their hands before they eat. Now, admittedly, I think, or, or I hope, that, that most of us agree that it is a good idea to wash our hands before we eat. In fact, if one of you noticed that I wasn't washing my hands before eating, I wouldn't call you a Pharisee if you pointed that out to me. But that's not really what this is about. The Pharisees aren't making this point because they're concerned about the disciples' hygiene. 
or because they're worried that the disciples are going to catch or spread some disease. This is about something else. As they say, it's about the tradition of the elders, which involves questions about who is ritually pure and who isn't. It's also important to, to note that this matter that the, the Pharisees are talking about here uh, isn't strictly about the Mosaic law either. As a number of, of commentators have pointed out, the tradition that the Pharisees are, are mentioning is, is not derived from the books of, Etica, of, of Exodus or, or the books of Leviticus or the books of Deuteronomy, but rather from the, the body of works that had sprung up under the rabbis to comment on the law. In other words, they're basing their charges here not on Scripture itself. They're, they're basing these charges on the debates and the discussion that had arisen among the group of religious and scholarly elites that had kind of popped up to explain the scriptures. And if you know anything about that body of commentary, you know that it's, it's vast. It was the perfect context in which someone could really major in the minors if they were so inclined. I read a really interesting book several years ago that, that compared the Talmud, which is one of the largest bodies of, of this kind of commentary, to the internet in the sense that, that it was always growing and ultimately, it, it becomes impossible to keep up with, nor would anyone really want to keep up with all of it. And like the internet, some of what is found in, in some of these works of, of, of commentary that emerged among the rabbis was helpful in guiding the people to, to understand the word of God. But there was also a lot that probably did more harm than good. Like a lot of the discussions that happen on the internet. Some of what the Pharisees were prone to do with these commentaries involved nitpicking, splitting hairs, using the word of God as a weapon to belittle or demean or exclude people from the community. Come to think of it, some of these Pharisees that Jesus dealt with on a daily basis would have been absolute experts on social media. I can see them drawing unwitting and, and unwilling participants into countless debates and then using what transpires there as an excuse to, to unfriend or mute or just shut down everyone who disagrees with them. And in the, the first century, their number one target for this kind of debate was, of course, Jesus himself. This, rather than any real concern for physical or even spiritual health, is at the heart of the attack in Matthew 15. They really just want to, want to target Jesus and his disciples to, to call them out publicly and, and, and try to shame them for not following some, some rule that, that, that is, is part of their uh, long commentary on the scriptures. And Jesus is smart enough not only to notice this, but to, to call them out on it. In fact, Jesus comes right back at them, not just by quoting the traditions of the elders, but by quoting scripture itself. Doesn't scripture say that you should honor your father and mother, Jesus asks? And yet you've worked out a little loophole regarding this. According to your tradition, Jesus says, if, if someone gives an offering to the temple instead of helping their father or mother who's struggling, that's acceptable. We can kind of see the subtext here. Jesus is kind of saying, you know, how convenient that this way of explicitly disobeying the fifth commandment also happens to enrich the priests and temple authorities. In other words, Jesus is charging that the Pharisees have forsaken what is of primary importance, that is the commands of God, for their selfish ends. And now they're doing it again. They're ignoring the ways that the kingdom of God is at work among Jesus and his disciples. And instead, they're focusing on the fact that they're not obeying some ritualistic practice, just so they can win some debate points and expose Jesus and his disciples in an argument. When Jesus quotes the prophet Isaiah, he highlights just how far the Pharisees have drifted in this regard. Like the corrupt religious leaders of Isaiah's day, the Pharisees say one thing and do another. They're hypocrites, he says. They talk an impressive game when it comes to, to piety and purity, and especially when it comes to diminishing the piety and purity of others. But if we could look into their hearts as God can, Jesus says, we would see that they're miles away from where they need to be. They aren't giving their attention or their energy to the most important things. Fellowship with God. The call to lead God's people faithfully. Commitment to God's truth and God's ways rather than their own. And until they can get their hearts right, until they can submit to God in these primary matters, humbling themselves before God's purposes, rather than letting their own agendas shape the way they approach him and 
shape the way they treat others, then they will never be fit to lead God's people. As Jesus says, they'll be blind guides, just leading everybody into the same pits that they fall into. And the things that come out of them, the things that come out of their mouths, the the fruits of self-righteousness and pride, just like the, the murderous and adulterous fruits that Jesus talks about here, all of this will be far worse than eating unclean foods or eating with unclean hands in terms of the damage that it does to the witness of the kingdom. Now, if the first part of this chapter shines some light on the ways that these kinds of religious debates over things like tradition and observances can cause leaders to to lose the plot, can tempt people to, to forsake actually caring for and leading the people in favor of attacking and alienating those around them. The second part of this chapter demonstrates how these kinds of attitudes and agendas might come to bear on the life of someone who is truly hurting. The story of the encounter between Jesus and the Canaanite woman is a tough one. It's always been a bit ambiguous. A lot of ink has been spilled as as Bible scholars and, and preachers and just committed readers of the scriptures have tried to discern what exactly is going on in this conversation. A woman comes to Jesus with a very real problem. Just as thousands upon thousands of people have come to Jesus with their problems throughout the gospel so far. Her daughter is possessed by a demon and needs deliverance. Jesus initially deflects her request. He states that he has only come to the lost sheep of Israel. He he waits for her to come directly to him rather than to his disciples. Again, people have wrestled with this passage, and and rightly so. It doesn't seem to be in line with Jesus' usual compassionate approach for him to do anything other than to to heal this woman's daughter immediately. Some scholars have gone so far as to say that this passage is a sign that Jesus himself was misguided, or Jesus himself was caught up in the Jewish-Gentile divisions that were so common during this time. But I'm not so sure that that really hits the mark, because... Whether Jesus was was healing the centurion's servant, as he did earlier in this gospel, whether he's holding up Naaman, the the Syrian, as a supreme example of faith, or even when Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, at various points in his ministry, Jesus subtly or, or not so subtly chips away at that barrier that existed between the children of Israel and the Gentiles. And as he's doing this, he's preparing his followers for that moment when they would be called to smash through that barrier entirely. So even if Jesus' ministry was primarily to Israel, as he says here, at various points throughout that ministry, he also served and healed and loved those who were outside the covenant. Because of this, I've I've always read this passage as, as Jesus subversively, maybe even sarcastically, pointing out the ridiculousness of these sorts of barriers. Rather than stumbling over the perspectives that so many of his fellow Israelites would have had, Jesus is highlighting the reality that if we let these kinds of divisions get in the way of helping a a child who is possessed by a demon, then we aren't embodying the covenant as faithfully or as purely as we might think. If a woman whose daughter is truly suffering can be turned away simply because of her ethnic identity, Is that in line with the way God's kingdom is unfolding? And the exchange between Jesus and this woman, if read in this light, demonstrates the absurdity that can sometimes overtake us if we major in the minors, if we fail to see how we might touch others' lives with God's compassion because we're blinded by the perspectives and patterns that we've inherited. Now, I'll freely admit that that my interpretation along these lines might not be the 100% correct one. It is my interpretation, after all. Matthew is not entirely clear about what's going on. But I have a hard time reading this passage without envisioning Jesus and the Canaanite woman sort of smiling at each other, both of them kind of in on the joke as they banter back and forth. You know, Jesus says, I wouldn't take bread away from the Jewish children of God and give it to a Canaanite dog. And the woman responds, yes, but... Even us lowly dogs should be entitled to some scraps. What comes next is important. Jesus acknowledges this woman's great faith. He grants her request. And this makes me think that, that this exchange was, was kind of his plan all along. 
that this conversation that unfolded, as uncomfortable as it might have been for those watching, as ambiguous as it might be for us, can also teach us what real faith looks like. It can show us what it might look like when we put aside minor differences for the greater purposes of God's kingdom. And in the, in the process, see how God can free those who are, who are held captive by sin and darkness by bringing them into his healing light. Like so many important passages of scripture, these stories, whether the one about the Pharisees attacking the disciples for eating with unclean hands or this exchange between Jesus and the Canaanite woman, are kind of tough. It takes some time to wrestle with them. It takes some time to sit with them. And even then, they may not be entirely clear to us. But I do think that one lesson we can derive from them is that so much harm can be done when we major in the minors. We may never thwart God's purposes or overcome God's kingdom. God is going to do what God is going to do, but we can certainly get bogged down in all the wrong things. In doing so, we can miss out on the beauty and the power of what God is accomplishing. We can let our our man-made traditions stand in the way of God's mighty work. We can let our divisive prejudices stifle our participation in God's beautiful mission to a world that needs him. But with the help of stories like this and with the example of our Messiah, our Savior, our Lord, we can learn to see just how powerful and just how beautiful our God truly is. And when we fix our eyes on what is most important, when we allow him to work in our lives and in this world and in in ways that we, we can see that he works in ways that might be small, they might even be unnoticeable, but they're anything but minor. Please pray with me. God, we confess that we are often distracted from what is most important. In the world in which we live, it's hard not to be drawn away, to have our attention grabbed and and pulled away towards things that ultimately don't matter in the light of your kingdom. And God, it's, it's our prayer this morning that we would, in the words of your son Jesus, that we would seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. Lord, that we would, in the words of Paul, fix our eyes on what is of first importance. That we would look to the, your son as the way and the truth and the life. That we would follow him with all our hearts and allow that to, to shape everything else we do, everything else we say. God, help us to, to train our attention on what is major, on what is primary in a world where there's so much that is minor and secondary that, that, that vies for our attention. And Lord, in all things, help us to follow the, the example of your son and, and to bear witness to the kingdom of your son in the things we say, the things we do, and simply in our way of being in the world. In your son's name that we pray these things. Amen. I'm going to call the, the worship team, or Joe, up, up at this point. And uh, we set aside time each week for invitation. Just a time to, to, to make decisions that God might be placing on our hearts. For some of us, that might mean confessing the name of Christ. It might mean receiving this, this good news of his gospel, of his love, his grace, his uh, forgiving and, and restoring salvation into our lives, uh, being baptized in him, and then walking in, in that path that he lays out for us. For others of us, maybe we've made that decision, but we, we're looking for a community of people to, to walk alongside to, to walk with, to pray for, and to be prayed for. And, and if, if you want to join us here at First Christian, that's, this is definitely a time when we can uh, begin that conversation, begin that process. And then finally, it's just a time for those who need prayer. Uh, if you're struggling with something, we'd love to pray with you. We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to see what God's doing in your life. Uh, but now as Joe sings, let's stand and join him. If you have a decision to make, please come forward.
Once again, it has uh, been a joy to get to worship with you all this morning, both those here in the sanctuary and also those worshiping with us at home. Um, in a moment, I'm going to close in prayer, but before we do, just a few announcements. First of all, uh, this afternoon uh, is our annual church picnic out at Camp ACC. Everyone's invited, uh, so please join us for that if you can. Uh, we'll, we'll start at, at 3 o'clock. The pool will be open, um, and so you're welcome to come out and, and swim. Um, and if you don't want to swim, you can still come out and, and just sort of in, enjoy, the, uh, enjoy the camp. Also, um, if, if you're willing uh, and you're, you're not swimming um, and, and you're out a little bit early, I know there's, um, it, it would be appreciated, anybody who can, um, just to kind of help set up for dinner. Um, so if you're able to get there a little bit early and, and, and maybe help out with that uh, sometime between 3 and 5, that would be um, much appreciated as well. Um, bring a, a side dish or a dessert to share. I think the, the burgers and drinks will, will be provided, uh, burgers and hot dogs and drinks will be provided uh, by the church. So just bring a side uh, and or a dessert to, to share. Um, Wednesday night, we'll be having our regularly scheduled Wednesday activities. So that uh, that means at 545, we'll be gathering in the fellowship hall for a meal. Um, and then that's followed um, at uh, 630 by um, youth group uh adult Wednesday night conversation and the kids ministry. Um, so join us for that. It's a great time in the middle of the week to, to pray together, to grow together, um, and to, to, to just get to spend some time together. Um, I've got an announcement from, from Ginger. Uh, she wasn't able to be here today. She was sick, but um, she has asked uh, that uh, I, I let you all know that this month um, Operation Christmas Child will be collecting school supplies. So things like pencils, erasers, notebooks or paper, um, if you can, can bring those uh, throughout the, the month of August, um, we'll be collecting those to, to be uh, given as gifts uh, all around the world um, in coming months. So if you have questions about that, uh, you can ask me. I can, I can uh, maybe help you with that. And then um, when you see Ginger, when she's back, uh, she'll have all the answers you need. But school supplies uh, for the month of August. Are there any other announcements? All right, let's uh, close in prayer. God, we thank you so much for this day, for calling us into this place, into this gathering, and, and um, pouring your life into us, Lord, through the time we spend here, through uh, the time we spend with each other, through, through hearing uh, from your word, through gathering at your table, through uh, drawing near to you in, in our moments of, of, of quiet and prayer and worship. Uh, God, we thank you for that. And, and now we thank you, Lord, that you send us out. We pray that as we go out into our neighborhoods, into our homes, into our schools and places of work, and wherever you send us, Lord, uh, that we would go as ministers and missionaries bearing witness to your kingdom and, and to the good news of your son, Jesus, in all that we do so that we might bring you glory. It's in your son's name and by the power of your spirit that we pray these things. Amen. Go in peace.